And welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles. And you're looking live at the White House, where Vice President Kamala Harris and President Biden are about to deliver remarks and sign the Respect for Marriage Act into law, codifying federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages for the first time in U.S. history. This historic legislation passed in bipartisan fashion in both chambers of Congress was led by Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin, the first openly gay person elected to the United States Senate. It, of course, comes off the heels of the June Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, where in a concurring opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas called for the court to revisit other landmark decisions, including on same-sex marriage. Several of the plaintiffs who are part of that landmark 2015 ruling on marriage equality are attending today's celebration at the White House alongside other LGBTQ activists. Today, signing also marks the full evolution of the president's own views. It comes a decade after the then Vice President Biden notoriously became the first to publicly support same-sex marriage ahead of his boss, President Obama. It was our 2012 appearance on Meet the Press, and he was pressed on his changed views on the issue, and we're going to show you that in a moment. First, though, let's go right to the White House. That's where NBC's Mike Memoli is standing by. So, Mike, obviously, uh, this ceremony just underway, but what do we expect to hear from the president at today's celebration? Well, Ryan, President Biden likes to quote Seamus Heaney and talk about how hope and history rhyme. And it really is worth underlining President Biden's role in getting us to this point where he's about to sign into law legislation codifying the protections not just for same-sex couples to marry, but also interracial couples to marry. The White House is making a note of those comments on Meet the Press 10 years ago when he became the first real national politician, yes, even ahead of his boss, President Obama at the time, to express support for same-sex marriage. But his history on this issue goes back even further to 1988, when he was helping to lead the fight as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee to the Bork nomination to the Supreme Court. In, in defeating Bork's nomination, ultimately, the Senate confirmed Confirmed Anthony Kennedy, who ended up writing that landmark decision in 2013, the Obergefell decision, which made marriage equality the law of the land. So now you see there Vice President Harris also speaking, and she has a role in this historical trend as well. She was the Attorney General of California in 2013, who refused to defend the Prop 8 uh, ban on same-sex marriage that was passed by California voters. Uh, and so she's making note of that as well. And we also just heard from the plaintiffs in a 2003 Massachusetts case, which made that state the first in the land to right. recognize same-sex marriage. Okay, Mike, we're right. going to now break away for a moment and go live to NBC News's special report on this sign. -in. NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air as President Biden gets ready to sign the historic Respect for Marriage Act into law. It's a bill that will provide federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriage rights. The legislation, which drew bipartisan support, was passed just last week by Congress. You see Vice President Harris right now speaking just ahead of the president, who will then uh, sign the legislation. As we wait for the president, let me bring in NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, remind us how we got here today. Well, Lester, they have staged what is really a celebration here on the South Lawn with activists and with people in the community who have long been trying to push for a respect for marriage. And this act does something that many Democrats in particular feel was long overdue, and that is to try to codify these protections for gay marriage, especially after the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned in the Dobbs case with the Supreme Court, trying to give greater civil rights protections for for civil rights and for interracial couples. All right, Lester. here is the president who says today is a great day. Not just for some, but for everyone. Everyone. Toward creating a nation where decency, dignity, and love are recognized, honored, and protected. Today, I sign the Respect for Marriage Act into law. <laughs> Deciding whether to marry who to marry is one of the most profound decisions a person can make. And as I've said before, and some of you might remember, on a certain TV show 10 years ago, <laughs> I got in trouble. Uh, <laughs> marriage, I mean this involved my heart, marriage is a simple proposition. Who do you love? And will you be loyal to that person you love? It's not more complicated than that. 
The law recognizes that everyone should have the right to answer those questions for themselves without the government interference. It also secures the federal rights protections that come with marriage. Like when your loved one gets sick and you've legally recognized as a next of kin, for most of our nation's history, we denied interracial couples and same-sex couples from these protections. We failed. We failed to treat them with equal dignity and respect. And now, the law requires that interracial marriage and same-sex marriage must be recognized as legal in every state in the nation. I want to thank all of you for being here today, for being part of this important movement. Jill, Kamala, Doug, my cabinet members, including Pete Buttigieg. And a special thanks to our performers, Joy, Sam, and Cindy. Look, you know, and the gay man's choir of Washington, D.C., gay man's marriage choir. And the members of Congress here today in the Senate, this bipartisan vote simply would not have happened without the leadership and persistence of a real hero, Tammy Baldwin, Senator Tammy Baldwin. And thank you, Susan Collins who did not rest until this bill got done. And the leader, Schumer, Senators Portman, Sinema, Tillis, Feinstein, Booker. And in the House, this would not have happened as much wouldn't happen without Nancy Pelosi and his people. <laughs> the quality and dignity of the LGBT community has always been her North Star. From her first speech on the House floor, pledging to end AIDS and signaling the bill and signing the bill today, all that time span. Madam Speaker, on behalf of all Americans, thank you for this and so much more for your decades of service. We also owe our special thanks to representatives like Jerry Nadler, who first introduced the Respect for Marriage Act a decade ago, David Cicilline and Sharice Davids as leaders of the Equality Caucus, and so many others, many of whom are here today, who did what was right. Standing behind me are dozens of plaintiffs. Up there, don't jump. The dozens of plaintiffs who fought for marriage equality through the years, as well as families whose existence would not be possible without the bonds of love and this law honors and protects. Look, we're here today to celebrate their courage and everyone who made the day possible. Courage that led to progress we've seen over the decades, progress that gives us hope that every, every generation will continue our journey toward a more perfect union. On this day, I think of Mildred and Richard Loving, a young woman of color and a young white man. They met as family friends and eventually fell in love. In 1958, they drove to Washington, D.C. to get married because the relationship was illegal in Virginia. They went back home. Five weeks later, police burst into their house and arrested them for the crime of being married, the crime of being married. They were sentenced to one year in prison unless they agreed to leave Virginia and not return for 25 years. They appealed the sentence and wasn't took till nine years later, in 1967, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled unanimously. It declared that laws against interracial marriage were unconstitutional. Today, Today, we're joined by one of the lawyers who represented the Lovings and the widow of their other lawyer that took the fight to the highest court because they believe their love should not be criminalized, but should be honored and respected. As Mildred Loving said, previous generations were, quote, bitterly divided over something that should have been so clear and right. So clear and right. No one could put it better. 
And later, Milder fought something else that's so clear and right. Marriage equality for LGBTQ Americans. And today, we celebrate our progress. From Hawaii, the first state to declare that denying marriage of same-sex couples is unconstitutional, to Massachusetts, the first state to legalize marriage equality for couples like Gina and Heidi, who just you just heard from. To all the advocates, <coughs> excuse me, who worked to block or overturn state bans, as you heard earlier, Vice President, Har Vice President Harris took a stand as Attorney General in California. Talked earlier. Others also spoke out. One of them was my son, Bo Biden, who was Attorney General of the state of Delaware, who filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court in favor of marriage equality and pushed to add gender identity protections into the law as well. President Biden speaking at uh, just ahead of the signing of the Respect Windsor. for Marriage Act there on the uh, White House lawn. Let me go right now to NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig. Uh, Garrett, you could argue this was would be difficult to pass in an election year, but they did with bipartisan support. How did they get here? That's right, Lester. Really, it was the Dobbs decision that lit the fire under Congress's feet to get this work done. The negotiations started over the summer between Susan Collins, Tammy Baldwin, who the president just shouted out. And then they held this bill through the election, hoping that it would relieve some pressure on Republicans who might want to vote for it, would be afraid to do so before an election. And the, those who came up with that strategy were rewarded with a significant bipartisan vote in both the House and the Senate to send this bill to the president's desk. And as the president's said the fingerprints of Speaker Pelosi are also all over this bill. A significant win for her. She came to Congress talking about gay rights issues when that was just simply not done in Washington, D.C. A fitting career coda for her, one of the last major bills that she will send to any president's desk as Speaker. Lester? Yeah, getting a standing ovation when the president uh, singled her out. All right, Garrett Haig, thanks very much. That concludes our coverage. We'll have much more tonight on NBC Nightly News. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt in New York. I'll see you on Nightly News. Good day. And for those of you just joining us, President Biden about to sign the Respect for Marriage Act into law. The bipartisan legislation codifies federal protections for same-sex and interracial marriages. Today's signing comes a decade after then-Vice President Biden first came out to publicly support same-sex marriage. And in today's remarks, President Biden mentioned his 2012 appearance on Meet the Press, where he was pressed on his changed views on the issue. Let's take a look back at that appearance. And you're comfortable with same-sex marriage now? I, I Look, I am vice president of the United States of America. Um, the president sets the policy. I am absolutely comfortable with the fact that men marrying men, women marrying women, and heterosexual men and women marrying women are entitled to the same exact rights, all the civil rights, all the civil liberties. And quite frankly, I don't see much of a distinction uh, beyond that. He, of course, famously did that before his boss at the time, Barack Obama. Obama would later join him in that position, but not until after he was reelected. Mike Memoli now back with us outside the White House. Uh, you know, there's obviously a big celebration uh, right there behind you, Mike Memoli. This is a pretty historic accomplishment for the Biden White House. Put it into perspective for us. Yeah, I think it's a celebration that you're seeing on the White House South Lawn at the moment, but it's one that's tempered by the reason that this piece of legislation was necessary. So to go back through the history there, that was a real seminal moment when, when then Vice President Biden expressed his support, becoming really one of the first national politicians to do so for marriage equality. It set the table then for President Obama to continue and end his evolution on the issue. And then, of course, three years later, when we had the uh, Supreme Court uh, striking down the Defense of Marriage Act, making marriage equality the law of the land. But this legislation that was passed in an election year late this year was only done because of the continued threats to marriage equality. It was the Dobbs decision, of course, striking down the right to an abortion nationwide. 
and the, and the concurring opinion from Clarence Thomas, who suggested that other rights, including the Obergefell decision, might be looked at. So there was a bipartisan consensus here, at least on this issue of same-sex marriage and also interracial marriage, to try to codify those protections into law. And so it's worth also being specific about what's in this bill and what's not. There are still on the books in more than 30 states across the country bans on same-sex marriage. And if the Supreme Court were to revisit Obergefell and then ultimately strike it down, those bans would go back into place. But what this federal legislation does is it ensures that those states, requires that those states have to continue to recognize marriages that were performed legally in those states that recognize it still. And so this is, you know, fits and starts. President Biden often talks about the principles of our founding documents, all men and women created equal. He says, we've often not lived up to that promise to the American people, but it, we continue as a nation to strive towards equality. And sometimes there are setbacks. And so this is a moment for President Biden to really invoke his history on this issue, especially we must note as he looks at a potential reelection campaign and offer another vote of promises made and promises kept. You know, my, Mike, 2022 started off pretty rocky uh, for Joe Biden, <laughs> and it looked like he was going to have a difficult uh, time in the midterm elections. Obviously, things went in a different direction, and now he started to stack up a couple of wins here, uh, and significant wins, we should say. You know, what kind of impact is that having not only on his potential reelection prospects, but the work that he could potentially do in the future in what will to be a divided Congress? So this is an example, and you heard President Biden in his remarks thanking, for instance, Republican Senator uh, Susan Collins of Maine. He acknowledged Republicans in the House who have supported this uh, particular legislation as well. And it's part of an effort by the White House to try to lay the groundwork for continued bipartisan success in the next Congress, even when Republicans take over the majority. It's a very daunting task. We know you and I, Ryan, the rules of the House, especially in the Republican caucus, the old Hastert rule, which is a real barrier potentially for Republicans bringing to the floor legislation that at least a majority of the Republicans in the House don't support. But President Biden and, and White House advisors who I've been talking to have pointed back at not just some of the high-profile bipartisan wins like the infrastructure law, the CHIPS Act, and yes, even this legislation he's about to sign, but other more low-profile bills uh, which offer a pretty heavy stack of support for President Biden's ability to work across the lines. They're going to be finding those, especially 17 Republicans elected in districts that President Biden himself carried as potential you know, avenues for progress continuing in the next Congress. Maybe not on high voltage issues like immigration, even though that's one issue the White House has suggested would be something they pursue in a new Congress, uh, but on sort of kitchen table bread and butter issues, especially also in the foreign policy space, there's a lot of consensus on finding, for instance, ways to continue to counter China's influence that the White House thinks they can find progress in. But this is a White House that also knows with that 51st vote in the Senate, even with Senator Sinema's uh, switch, that they can at least do what they know is the Senate's able to do, which is confirm a lot of judges and mm -hmm. potentially fill some vacancies quickly, if there are any, in his cabinet as well. Well, Mike, I know we as Americans have become accustomed to the idea of, be of gay marriage being legal and accessible. Uh, but obviously, there was enough of a concern to get this legislation passed, and it's likely that when the history books write the story of Joe Biden's presidency, this is going to be one of the top things that they mention. Mike Memley at the White House, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And we'll have more on the president's signing of the Respect for Marriage Act in a moment. But turning now to the drama that continues to rock the financial world and parts of Washington. The Justice Department today unsealed an eight-count indictment against former crypto CEO and political donor Sam bakeman fried also known as SBF. They allege that bakeman fried intentionally defrauded customers and lenders in a wide-ranging multi-billion dollar conspiracy, describing it as one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the SEC, is a fraud case that's just as old as time. Somebody saying this is where your money's going to go and instead taking that money and putting it somewhere else to their personal benefit. That's what they say happened to one big pot, one big bank account and siphoned a fair amount of it off uh, is a loan to a private hedge fund that he controlled, Alameda, and that that company uh, invested in a number of different things, uh, a lot of them highly illiquid, illiquid rather, and a lot of them speculative. And when the crypto market started to collapse, remember just a couple of years ago, a, a single coin, a single Bitcoin was trading at 64,000, today closing below 18,000. When those assets 
assets started to fall and put pressure on Alameda, when other things that they invested in started to fall and put pressure on FTX. And as soon as another company, a competitor, said, hey, one of the coins that FTX minted, so it was a, it was a type of a cryptocurrency that FTX created, uh, we're selling out of that. We're, we're liquidating our holdings in it. Customers began to get concerned. They asked for their money back, and that created another tale as, uh, as old as time, the old run on the bank. Uh, customers started to withdraw their funds, take cash out of FTX just when they needed it most, and that's how we ended up here today. The fraud being created in, in basically the way SBF ran the company and in instituting none of the controls, as you heard its current CEO, John Ray say. Tom, you didn't need to remind me about the price of Bitcoin, I, about a thousand bucks that I play with. I've been ignoring that. I don't even want to think about it. So you reminded me <laughs> about how much that 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 value not has dropped. Fault. Yes, it's not. Uh, Mackenzie, let's bring you in here. So John Ray, who, who's an expert uh, in these kind of reclamation projects, he testified about the lack of record keeping within FTX. Just take a listen to this. This one is unusual, and it's unusual in the sense that Literally, you know, there's no record keeping whatsoever. It's the absence of record keeping. Employees would communicate, you know, invoicing and expenses on on Slack, which is, you know, essentially a, a you know a way of communicating right. for chat rooms. Uh, they use QuickBooks, a multi-billion-dollar company using QuickBooks. 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 Uh, nothing against QuickBooks. Very nice tool, just not for a multi-billion-dollar company. Uh, there's no independent board, right? We, we had one person really controlling this. Uh, no independent board. That's highly unusual. In a QuickBooks. <laughs> Just, you know, walk us through this, the highlights of this hearing, McKenzie. I mean, how will the poor record keeping at FTX make it harder, though, for them to piece together exactly what happened? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that he said anything that was all that surprising from day one with that first day filing that we saw. He just really laid into the existing structure, the complete lack of record keeping, the complete lack of concern for any sort of uh, proper due diligence. And I, I think that it really goes to the point that kind of the first hurdle here is the fact that prosecutors have to get Bankman freed stateside. So before we can even think about how they're going to prosecute this case, or make, you know, make sense of the books, you have to land the subject. And you have this, you know, 1990, 1991 extradition treaty between the U.S. and the Bahamas that does clearly spell out that order for extradition to be justified. Uh, but SBF has the ability to appeal that. So this is a process that could potentially take months, if not longer. And I think that that's really, when I've been speaking to legal experts, they say that's the first thing to clear here. All right, Danny, let's talk about the legal part of all of this, specifically count eight. That's where he's being charged with campaign finance violations. And, and take a listen to what he told Chuck on Meet the Press reports just a few months ago about his donations. Well, you, don't, you think every money you spend in politics should be disclosed publicly? Are you comfortable with that? I think that I, I think what I would say is, you know, if there was a norm where every dollar that ever in donated mm -hmm. in politics was to be disclosed publicly... Um, I would have a, a lot of sympathy for that. I think I might support it. I haven't thought carefully about it enough to know. But well, it I sounds so. like what you're saying is maybe there's some donations that you have made that you wouldn't make if you knew they were going to be immediately public. So I think I don't. I don't generally think about it that way. I generally Fair think enough. of it as like these are these are the right uh, you know the right contributions to make. Mm -hmm. So break down what this campaign finance charge is and and how it's different from what SBF has been saying publicly. I can't possibly break down what SPF said to Chuck Todd in that last uh, bit of sound there. But uh, the indictment uh, is rather simple, and I think that's part of the government strategy here, including the campaign finance law violation. I mean, it pretty simply boiled down alleges that he donated knowingly too much in violation of campaign finance laws. And actually, when you look at the entire indictment, I can already imagine the government's opening statement to the jury at trial and it's going to be you don't need to understand crypto to understand this case crypto is a side issue so you can breathe a sigh of relief for all of us out there that don't fully understand it this is straight up a fraud case this is a straight up campaign finance law violation case crypto is a side issue 
the fraud, building on what Tom uh, Winter said, is as old as crime itself. It's as basic as it gets. Money coming in one place, uh, people entrusted them with the money. They thought it was going to one place. It went somewhere else. Similar with the campaign finance law violations, those donations were made in violation of campaign finance laws. And that sound that you just heard from Chuck Todd might be one more piece of evidence the government uses to show that whatever he was rambling about it evidenced that he knew that campaign finance laws existed. So, Mackenzie, to Danny's point that this really doesn't have that much to do with crypto, obviously it's got to make investors nervous, though, right? What does the future of crypto look like? I think that trust is permanently eroded among some people. I, a lot of folks placed blind trust in FTX, a cryptocurrency exchange, but also in Sam Bankman-Fried. He was this emblem of the industry and really this bastion of trust. Like six months ago when the entire uh, industry began to fold, you saw bankruptcy after bankruptcy. It was Sam Bankman-Fried who really came to the rescue and reassured people of the longevity of the digital asset space. And when he found out that the, the operation that he was running under the hood was essentially functional like a fraud, a lot of people, their confidence was, you know, irrevocably lost in crypto assets. And so I think that for one thing, people are going to think twice, especially those retail consumers who were parking in, in some cases their life savings on these platforms, thinking of it as a bank, uh, not as a, as a risky investment. I think people will think twice there. Uh, and, and regulators are coming in. I mean, even, to, you know, today you've got the House holding a hearing tomorrow, the Senate. We're going to see regulation become a much bigger part of that dialogue. And that might put some people off from uh, wanting to get that exposure to cryptocurrencies. And then, Danny, quickly, why would prosecutors decide to charge him right now as opposed to letting him give his testimony in front of Congress, which would have been under oath? Uh, prosecutors may have decided that they have enough information and that they've collected enough in terms of his public statements. Uh, strategically, we may never know why they chose to pull the trigger now as opposed to letting him talk a little more. Uh, but more than likely, they may have even had concerns about where he was in the Bahamas. Yes, there is an extradition treaty, but extradition treaties and extradition itself doesn't always run as smoothly as folks would hope. Uh, and in this case, even though it's pretty clear under the wording of the extradition treaty that he comes back, he should be surrendered. Uh, as we know, you can appeal that, you can delay that. Maybe the government figured it was better now than later. All right, Danny, Mackenzie, and before them, Tom Winter, thanks to all of you for your expertise. We appreciate it. And up next, it's the economy. New signs inflation may be cooling, even as housing costs are soaring. Some more key takeaways from today's economic report and what it means for tomorrow's Federal Reserve meeting as the central bank tries to avoid a potential recession. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. After months of aggressive rate hikes from the Fed, we may finally be seeing signs the inflation is cooling. The Labor Department reported that consumer prices rose 7.1 percent last month compared to a year ago. Now, that may sound really high, but it's actually lower than expected. And it's the smallest 12-month increase since December of last year. It comes a day before the Fed is expected to announce yet another rate increase, although it is expected to be smaller than the central bank's recent hikes. This morning at the White House, President Biden acknowledged that prices remain too high, but he said today's data is a hopeful sign of a turnaround. In a world where inflation is rising at double digits in many major economies around the world, inflation is coming down in America. In fact, this new report is the fifth month in a row where annual inflation has fallen in the United States. Make no mistake, prices are still too high. We have a lot more work to do, but things are getting better, headed in the right direction. For no, more now, I'm joined by Ken Rogoff. He's a professor of public policy and economics at Harvard. So, Ken, uh, just first off, how do you think today's report's going to impact the Fed's decision tomorrow? Well, it's not going to impact what they're going to do tomorrow. I think they broadcast they're going to raise in their policy interest rate half a percent, but it could affect their messaging about what they intend to do next. And the messaging affects mortgage rates, car loan rates, and all the longer term debt of where interest rates are going. It, it was unambiguously better news than expected. But I think one has to be careful not to make too much of it. It's very good news, but it's not decisive. So how much of an impact have the Fed's previous rate hikes had on this report? Or is it just the economic conditions correcting themselves? Where would you rank it? 
I think a big chunk of this is the economic conditions correcting themselves. Uh, used car prices were just crazy, and now they're falling, and that feeds into the CPI. The oil prices are volatile, even in normal times. They've come down. That feeds into gas prices. Uh, but the, the Fed's hikes are certainly starting to cool wage growth in some areas, like the tech sector is laying people off. But on the other hand, the service sector, which is just giant in our economy, the wage growth is very strong, very strong demand for workers. That could get passed through into prices eventually. And I think the all the action is still ahead. So uh, the core inflation, according to this report, rose 0.2 percent in November compared to the previous year. Explain for those of us that aren't economics majors what core inflation is and whether that's the number we should really be watching. Well, the, there are certain things which are just very, very volatile, like uh, gas prices are very volatile. Everybody knows that. They may not know why, but they are. And it's partly because oil prices are very, very volatile for just normally they're very volatile. Uh, so gas prices reflect that. So food also tends to be pretty volatile, which I think people know. So when the Fed tries to get an idea of, well, you know, what's going on behind all this volatility, they try to strip that out. There are different ways of doing it. Um, and that was also a good number. But on the other hand, uh, we had a bad number uh, earlier of looking at what happened to wage growth. I mean, it was good for workers. Wage growth was high, mm -hmm. but event, it's probably higher than sustainable, going to pass through to prices. And again, services are a very big part of our economy, and there's a lot of repressed uh, needs for hiring. Uh, that's good, but I think it's going to bid up wages, may bid up prices. But again, this was good news. No question. Mm -hmm. uh, look better and improve the odds. But it's not, you know, game over. Everything's going to be great. I think it's still going to be very tough next year. And, I, and just to be clear, I think tough to have a soft landing where the Fed brings inflation down to, say, two and a half percent forget 2%, 2.5% or 3%, and we don't have a pretty significant recession, that's still not easy. Okay, so inflation, still an issue heading into 2023 for sure. Ken Rogoff, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And after thank the break, you. And after the break, the White House celebrates a series of wins on gas prices, inflation, and now marriage equality as Congress hurries to meet a looming deadline to fund the government. My panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. It has been a busy day of smiles for President Biden. This morning, he got to take a modest victory lap over new economic data that shows the pace of inflation is slowing. And then, as you heard earlier this hour, he got to spike the football as he signed a federal marriage equality bill into law, completing a decade-long journey for him in the White House. Take a listen to some more of his remarks. Racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, they're all connected. But the antidote to hate is love. This law and the love it defends strike a blow against hate in all its forms. And that's why this law matters to every single American, no matter who you are or who you love. This shouldn't be about conservative or liberal, red or blue. No, this is about realizing the promise of the Declaration of Independence. All right, let's talk about this and everything else going on in Washington. Joining me now on set is Washington Post congressional reporter Mariana Sotomayor, Simone Sanders Townsend, the former senior advisor to Vice President Harris, and of course the host of Simone on MSNBC, and Republican strategist Jim Dornan. Uh, Mariana, Simone, Jim, thank you all for being here. Simone, let's start with you. Obviously, you were at the, the front end of this success that the Biden administration has had in your capacity with the vice president. This lame duck has been pretty productive uh, for the Biden administration. They clearly have some momentum. What do you, you know, put this into, into context for us. How important was today and what does it mean for the administration going forward? Look, I think today was personally important for uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris and a number of the uh, of the advocates and allies that have fought for to, to see this day. Now, critics will tell you, and I think it's important that we talk about, that this bill, if, let's just say, the Supreme Court uh, guts Obergefell, um, 
this bill will not necessarily mm -hmm. protect people across the country in places and spaces um, where there are laws on the books that discriminate against LGBTQ plus Americans. But it's an important first step. I think the momentum that we're seeing from the administration here is, is, is the culmination of a lot of work that has been done. Behind, things that happened months ago, I would even argue a year and a half ago, are coming, came to fruition this year. And that gives President Biden momentum going into uh, January, which a time where we should see if he's mm -hmm. going to run for president or not. So he's going to be running high going mm -hmm. into what many people, myself included, think is a re-election announcement. Yeah. So, Mariana, when you think about the success of the Biden administration, what they would point to, they have a bipartisan infrastructure plan, all that COVID relief that they've done. Now they have mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, at least somewhat codified into law. But when you look at his approval numbers... It's not necessarily translating all these wins. You know, he is hovering in the 40s right now. Uh, the most, most recent poll does show him at around a 46 percent approval rating uh, that came after the election. It seems like he can't sh get over that 50 percent hump. W where's the disconnect between the results and the perception the American people have? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this because you would think that it would correlate in some way, and maybe it will if, you know, the inflation threat kind of starts to go down. A lot of people do blame the administration for the good and the bad in that. Um, but I kind of think about it through the midterms. A lot of these House Democrats in particular didn't necessarily run with Biden. It actually, you know, of those very vulnerable places that I went to, I think it took Susan Wilde in Pennsylvania 45 minutes into a, an event to just mention his name. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Alyssa Slotkin. However, they would talk about all of these wins. Mm -hmm. And they would also mention that Biden signed this into law and or that he, you know, ran on Build Back Better, which parts of that were implemented, not the full right. thing that he had campaigned on. So I do think that there must be something with, with voters who maybe disassociate what Congress is doing as something that maybe Biden is also able to tout as a win. They kind of see it as, oh, well, this is my member of Congress kind of doing this, voting mm -hmm. for these things. We should maybe reward them. But that could change as Biden, and if he does yeah. run, if he puts that into the forefront, he could tout a lot of different things that will remind the public. Well, Jim, his success may come to a screeching halt, right, as the as, as things turn over and Republicans take control of the House of Representatives. You know, there's going to be gridlock on some level, no matter what. And, and usually there's some blame put on both parties. But, you know, it, Republicans seem to be pretty content to prevent any kind of forward momentum for the Biden administration. Is that going to help Biden necessarily because he has a foil now that he didn't have before? Uh, in some ways, I think it will. And I, actually, I thought that's where Simone was going is the momentum will carry into January and maybe get some of these things done that there is some bipartisan mm -hmm. agreement on. Um, there was on the on the same sex marriage bill, obviously, the infrastructure bill. I mean, this is why Joe Biden was elected to the presidency, right? It's because he was the great compromiser mm -hmm. and he was able to talk to Republicans as well as Democrats. So it'll it'll be interesting to see what his agenda is going to be for the next two years. Yeah, do I think the Republicans are going to give him a hard time? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, let's hope they don't do anything crazy like shut down the government or give him a complete momentum builder <laughs> going into 2024 like, unfortunately, our party has in the past. Yeah. I, I just, I, I didn't go there with like, oh, the bipartisan things he might be able to get done going forward. It's because I do think that this next Congress is going to be quite difficult um, for this particular White House, the oversight hearings, the investigations, um, many of them baseless, but Republicans will have power in the House of Representatives, and I think it will be a lot harder than it was a year ago or even six months ago to work with the incoming right. House leadership. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So, you know, we did see a bit of a shakeup in Washington this week <clears throat> as Senator Kirsten Sinema, who's been somebody that's been willing to work with Republicans and been somewhat of a foil of the Democratic White House. Uh, and she was there at the White House today uh, uh, with the uh, uh, signing of the same-sex marriage bill. Uh, she has said that she's going to uh, become an independent. Now, she hasn't given her intention yet for 2024, but she sets up the potential of a three-way race in one of the most competitive states in the country. And I talked to Ruben Gallego yesterday, who's obviously a member of Congress and is flirting with the idea of a run. He tried to convince me that Cinema staying in would actually be better for him if he ran as a Democrat. Take a listen. A lot of the concern from Democrats or people that would like to see this seat at least held by someone that leans yeah. Democratic is that a three-way primary may benefit Republicans. How much does that concern you? And talk yeah. to me about that. <laughs> Not at all. Actually, as a matter of fact, if Kirsten Sinema runs and actually stays in the race, uh, she will help the Democrat win. So I'm very excited for her to stay in the race. I think it will almost assure the fact that 
the Senate seat will stay in the Democratic hands. And why is that? Explain to me why. It's that very works. simple math. The Republicans have not been able to hold a coalition together for quite a while. Democrats have for the last three cycles. <coughs> with a big uh, voting block of Latinos that are not going to go any, anywhere else, and they certainly aren't going to go if there's a Latino uh, member of Congress that's running oh, uh, on the ticket. And at the end of the day, that's what it takes to win, and so no, it doesn't matter. So, Simone, despite the fact that there has been a lot of math in this show, especially with the, the Bankman Freed coverage, I, I'm not a math major, but I'm, I'm struggling to understand his theory here, especially when Mark Kelly, who's pretty popular, you know, only won by about five or six points. If you take all of those voters and split them up, isn't the Republican uh, the one that benefits in a situation I like that? I think so. I think what I think Ruben Gallego was saying is in, is, in fact, that Democratic voters in Arizona are quite disaffected with Senator Kristen Sinema. Mm -hmm. And because... It is the Democratic machine that got her elected the first time. Given what many people view as her antics and now switching to an independent, the machine would not support her and Democratic voters would go to the actual Democrat in the race. That is a big if. Mm -hmm. I also think there's people like Greg Stanton, right, the current current congressman, former mayor of Phoenix, who I also spoke to a, a couple days ago, and he said he's weighing yeah. uh, getting into the race. So. I frankly don't think Kristen Sinema is going to run for re-election. I think this is her, her last stand, and she's going to go off and do something else and, and not bother herself with the primary, but that's just me. Well, let's clip this tape and have it for you for the latest <laughs> one. If you talk to uh, Senator Sinema, she will tell you off the record that she thinks she's been elected because of Republicans. So this is not a surprise to me whatsoever. Um, now, and if the Republicans nominate somebody crazy like Carrie Lake, then mm -hmm. I think she's got a very legit shot at winning. Oh. I what does Kristen Cinema stand for? And I think that that is the question. When when I worked at the White House, uh, one of the biggest frustrations when talking to senators on the Hill is when the senators don't tell you where they stand. And Kristen Cinema is notorious for not knowing where she stands, where her hard lines are. People can be mad at Joe Manchin all they want, but he's very clear about what he believes. Right. People don't know where Kristen Cinema well, stands, and I think enough. that'll Mar be an issue. Mariana, Mar 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 let's take a deep dive into at least part of Cinema's thinking, and that's the party registration numbers in Arizona, which are pretty revealing. 34%, almost 35% say are Republicans, registered as Republicans. Only 30% are Democrats. Look at that number in the middle. 34.67 are independents. Now, it's one thing to say you're an independent. How you vote actually is a little bit more revealing. People don't wave the flag of the independent party. We don't have conventions for independent party candidates. But does she have an argument that she could build a coalition that doesn't currently, uh, that hasn't currently been tapped into so specifically? I mean, she, at least on Capitol Hill, has made herself known as someone that you need to negotiate and you can't just forget her point of view. She always wants to be in the room. She's been working even like on an immigration bill that is just likely never going to pass. Like she has been trying to work with Republicans for a long time to make inroads. And it is totally an electoral decision. She just running as a Democrat likely, and, and there's been, I think, internal polls, even um, Stanton put it out there, a hypothetical mm -hmm. matchup where she just completely loses Democratic support. She can't even get like 20%. Mm -hmm. So for her, it makes sense to run as an independent. I think it might be difficult for her on Capitol Hill to get that support from Democrats, but it really is going to be a headache for someone like Majority Leader Schumer and also the DSEC. Are they going to get involved in primaries? That's a really big question. They tend to not. But if there's a Democrat running, are they going to support right. the incumbent or someone else? And you've noticed so far all the Democrats in the United States Senate holding their fire. We like Kristen Sinema. We like working with her. They still need her vote for at least two years, regardless of what she's going to do. Yep. So nobody's going to upset her quite yet. Mariana, Simone, Jim, excellent conversation. I appreciate you, all, appreciate you all being here. Still to come, a major announcement from the Biden administration on nuclear fusion, an achievement that the administration officials are describing as a, quote, BFD. Details on the technology and what it can do with the nuclear expert next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Last week at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory, anywhere in the world. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. 
Welcome back. That was Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm officially announcing a landmark scientific breakthrough, one that could change the future of clean energy and maybe alter the future of our planet. Now, as you heard the secretary say, scientists at a California lab used a process called nuclear fusion to produce more energy than they started out with, replicating the process that powers the sun. I'm joined now by Greg Gatzko. He's a physicist and former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, during the Obama administration. I can't think of a better person to talk to about a topic like this, Greg. I mean, this is a powerful scientific breakthrough. What was your first reaction to the news as a physicist and someone that served as a former nuclear regulator? Well, as a physicist, that, that's, it's amazing. It's a really cool result, to, to be quite honest. It's something they've been working at really for decades to try and achieve. And it's always, uh, you know, as a scientist, it's always wonderful when you can take these ideas, these theoretical ideas that could have tremendous potential for for energy production and other uses, and you're able to reproduce it in the laboratory. So I, I think, you know, tremendous um, kudos to, to the work that was done uh, by the, the the researchers in the Department of Energy at at, uh, at at the National Ignition Facility. So let's talk about your time at, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and what it means for this discovery. You were there for three years uh, during the Obama administration, and you wrote this in 2019 after you'd left. I now believe that nuclear power's benefits are no longer enough to risk the welfare of people living near these plants. I became so convinced of that years after departing office, I've now made alternative energy development my new New career, leaving nuclear power behind. The current and potential costs in lives and dollars are just too high. So how you feel about that? Uh, how does that connect to this discovery? Is it the same thing or are we talking about something different? Well, nuclear fusion is, you know, is about the same as nuclear fission as, as wind power is the same as solar power. So they just unfortunately both have nuclear in the title. And mm -hmm. so they, they often get lumped together. But it really is a very different uh, way to generate electricity. You don't have the same hazards that you would have from a nuclear fission reactor. The problem, however, as wonderful as this, this result was, we're really a long way away from being able to use this technology really to, to generate electricity. You know, we're, if you think of the aviation industry as an analogy, this is akin to the Wright Brothers' first flight at, at Kitty Hawk. We have a long way to go before we would have a, a product that we could use in commercial applications. And quite frankly, we would always have to compare that to the other sources that we have out there. And right now, we generate a lot of electricity and can generate a lot of electricity without carbon emissions from wind, from solar, from geothermal, from hydroelectric. So there are alternatives today. And this is just one more potential alternative. But that potential is, is really a long way in the future. So you, you say it's going to take a long time. I mean, give us an example of some of the things that need to happen uh, to scale it up in a responsible way. Yeah, so what they did at, at, at NIF was they were able to create a small amount of extra energy from this laser. Uh, to make that into a viable electricity production facility, you would have to get that excess energy to be a lot bigger, and you'd have to be able to fire those lasers almost continuously. Right now, it takes them about a week to reset the laser and to be able to, to reset the experiment and do it all over again. And the energy they got out, while it was extra energy, which shows that in fact they created fusion, it's still not enough energy to compensate for all the energy that went into making the lasers actually work. So if you wanna use this as a, as a viable electricity production machine, you have to get those numbers a lot higher. You also then have to figure out how to take that energy, which is largely in the form of heat, and convert that heat into electricity. So that's the second step. Now we generally know how to do that, but it might be a little bit different process when we're dealing with a fusion facility. So all of those things are really far into the future. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking decades until this could potentially be uh, a viable source of electricity generation. And so how concerned are you that this type of technology could be used for ill intentions? Like, Is this something that could be used to produce weapons of mass destruction or something along those lines in the future? No, it, it really is a much more benign form of electricity generation than, than nuclear fission. The, the, the material that you use is, is essentially a type of, of, of hydrogen. 
Uh, the, you do get some radioactive materials, but they're not in large quantities. It's really a result of the fusion process, kind of changing the characteristics of the material you use in the machine itself. So it doesn't have the same kinds of hazards that we would see with, with nuclear fission, which is really one of the tremendous promises of it. The, the fuel source is in principle readily available. It's basically taking a, a particular type of water and processing it a little bit. Uh, and the waste products are, are really very minimal. So, and you of course don't have air emissions like you have with fossil fuels. So it, it does hold tremendous promise, but you know, tomorrow or, or in the next week or next month, nobody's building a fusion reactor, but we can build other clean energy sources, wind, solar, geothermal, mm -hmm. energy yeah. efficiency, all those alternatives exist. All right, Greg Gasco, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And, Absolutely. And while we are talking science, a programming note, tune in at 9 p.m. Eastern for an NBC News Now special, Battlefield Space to the Moon and Beyond. It's an in-depth look at the geopolitically charged new space race. And thank you so much for being with us this hour. Chuck, of course, back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.